اوكي طيب جود افترنون طبعا انفورشنتلي دكتور جميل ابولوجايز فور بريزنتينج ذيس تونايت سيشن بيكوز اوف ان ايجنت سيركمستانس ذات كيم اب So uh, I took over in a short notice and uh, I'm going to present this sort of interactive session. So it has to be interactive because we are going to uh, showcase some uh, data and we discuss it together, okay? So uh, you are mute anytime you wanna participate, just unmute, okay? So let's get it started. The first one is about this ECG. So what do you think about it? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to take it? Uh, sinus rhythm. Yes. With? Sinus rhythm with, with pulses alternates. I wish so much we change this word of pulse alternance. Electrical It's a common alternance. mistake, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Electric, so this is electric alternance, yeah. Pulse alternance is, is something clinical and it's so different because you have like variable pulse amplitude in heart failure or severe heart failure precisely. But this is electrical alternance and it's a sign of Uh, what, does it mean, what does it mean? Is it? Anybody agrees 100% with that? It's a sign of tamponade or... Here, circumstantially, yes, precarded effusion, large precarded effusion. Circumstantially, yes, it's a supportive sign of tamponade because in tamponade, the larger the effusion, more likely to have tamponade, yeah? Uh, but it's basically a sign of large effusion because the heart is kind of swinging. So it comes back and forth closer to your leads on the surface. So that's why you get these kind of alternance. So it's a sign of a large precardial effusion and that the heart is swinging, okay? Indirectly, yeah, a supportive sign of tamponade. Tachycardia, blood pressure, and all of that, yeah, it's more into the tamponade physiology. Uh, remind you that sometimes you can get sort of alternance with fast tachycardia of any kind. SVTs, they might manifest different amplitude, okay? So not necessarily effusions. Okay, what changes the density of this Doppler signal? The one on the left, the one on the right. The density has changed. Why? It's for the same patient, the same signal, the same interrogation, but they have done something. And that something is? The angle. You see the, uh, the angle, yeah, it's probable, exactly. The angle of interrogation, if it's more into parallel, you get better and crispy signal. Yeah, uh, this is one probability. Mm -hmm. Other probability, especially when you see on the right side, you see much of noise, right? It's showing through the signal. And that's because of the contrast. They have given contrast. And that contrast is usually agitated saline. So sometimes this is another utility of agitated saline. We know we are using agitated saline for shunts and persistent left SVC and all of that. But sometimes we can use them to enhance the signals, especially the TR signal. It has been used and we are not using it anymore because there is a concern that it maximizes erroneously the peak velocity. So it, 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 it misleads you uh, into higher velocities and stuff like that. But in terms of enhancing the signal, it was good, okay? So it can be used for Doppler signal enhancement. Uh, these are two patients with uh, anterior wall MI, as you see. Is any difference between these two patients in terms of prognosis? 
or you can't tell by the ECG alone? You can't tell. The face is uh, straight like you can. a uh, pom 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 stones and it's more line than pom stones. It is very high yeah. many elevation and the more than six leaves, which is extensive anterior MI, anterior yeah. lateral MI, which makes it poor prognosis when compared with the second. Yeah, okay. Leaf. Exactly. So this is uh, the first one on the top is the tomb stoning, which is like this one because it looks like the tombstone and, and it's prognostic. So initially uh, we know and you all know that the extent of the ST segment elevation is prognostic because that tells us about how much of uh, the myocardium is but the magnitude it's known that even the extent of the elevation itself is prognostic okay so it means more of injury and more of transmural injury in particular so it's the extent and the degree of st segment elevation okay now, if we take these and probably you are doing exercise ECG, you are doing exercise ECG a lot. I, I, I knew that. In exercise ECG, of course, you are incorporating uh, a lot of data together, some of which are clinical, some of which are ECG, uh, duration of exercise on the treadmill, the ECG findings, the blood pressure response, the heart rate response, and all of that. You might use a scoring system like the Duke treadmill score, nomograms, and stuff like that. Uh, but when it comes to the analysis of the ST segment shift during exercise, it's so important you focus on the morphology and the extent. Again, here, the morphology of the ST segment depression and the extent of the ST segment depression. So the number of the leads that manifest ST segment depression is prognostic. It's meaningful. And how the ST shift downward is also meaningful. If we take the first one, you see that's a horizontal ST segment depression. And the second is down sloping ST segment depression. The other one is the up sloping. So there is up sloping, horizontal, and down sloping. It's known that the down sloping is what about ischemia? What does it mean about ischemia in terms of diagnostic accuracy in comparison to the horizontal and to the apislobic? Mm -hmm. Is this question clear? Yani, how does the morphology of the ST segment depression is meaningful in the diagnostic accuracy of ischemia? Yes, uh, the, the upper sloping uh, ST segment uh, depression uh, might be normal and it might uh, not uh, signify, uh, signify ischemia. Exactly. And yes, uh, the, the down sloping ST segment elevation probably is, is more accurate even than the horizontal. So the significant for the diagnosis of ischemia is down, slo uh, down sloping and the horizontal. With the horizontal more exactly. sensitive than is the down sloping more than the horizontal one. And that exactly. So in terms of specificity to the diagnosis of ischemia, the down sloping comes first, followed by the horizontal, and last, the up sloping. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that when you have an ST segment elevation, you have to see uh, the QRS complex beside it. Is there any Q waves or not? Because if you have an ST segment elevation on non Q bearing leads, that is so serious. This is kind of STEMI. But if it's just elevates on the Q wave uh, bearing leads, that's probably no big deal, you know, because sometimes the response to scar tissue is it gets elevated on these segments, okay? Uh, though there are some studies that have shown. Um, if you have an ST segment elevation in the non Q bearing leads, this is a sign of viability in these segments. Uh, but the uh, accuracy of this outcome is not so clear. 
but there was actually some few studies that have suggested uh, that the Q wave uh, leads when they get this segment elevation during exercise, uh, it indicates variability. Okay, but anyhow, I want you to focus on the morphology of the ST segment depression when you are interpreting exercise ECG. Okay, so it's not about just uh, there is ST segment depression qualitatively. You have to see the morphology. You have to quantify how much of depth the ST segment uh, is depressed and how much of the leads or the extent of the involvement in different leads. These are all prognostic data. You incorporate all of these data in your final report. Okay, so anybody can take this one. This is a pullback, uh, invasive hemodynamics. So what do you think about it? The first one on the, the top. Mm -hmm. There is gradient between the LV and the distal vertical. Okay. Okay. Mm, on the LV, yes, uh, a vertical. This is a proximal and this stuff. So most likely this is a coarctation. Exactly. So, uh, Harin, thank you so much. That's right, yeah. So this is a pullback from the LV to proximal aorta to distal aorta, right? And there is a gradient between the distal and proximal aorta, and this is coarctation, okay? Uh, if we compare this one to this one, Again, pull back from the LV to LV to aorta. Now it's different. What is it? This is now hookum. Hookum. Uh, is it necessarily hookum? Could it be subaortic? Because no. what and we see in yeah, here, yeah, here. Yeah. Any subvalvular. Any subvalvular lesions. Yeah. Uh, and the gradient between be, between the L, L, uh, between the lower uh, between the LVOT and the uh, LV, it is any subvalvular exactly. will get you the same picture. Yeah. So most importantly, what you have to know from this slide is that you have LV LV gradient, and when you have LV LV gradient, meaning you are dealing probably with hookum or subortic and this stuff. Uh, in this case, I agree with Abdullah in what he, uh, his analysis, uh, but it's most likely who come rather than subortic membrane in particular, in, in this particular tracing. Why did I say that? Because of? A little bit long segment. Look at this one. Look at the aortic wave form itself. How does it look like? This is the spike and dome configuration of hookum. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So if the aortic wave form has this configuration and you have LV, LV gradient, this is hookum mock sub aortic membrane. So sometimes you can tell precisely what type of, uh, I mean, LV, LV gradient, okay? But not always, but if the waveform is as clear as this one is spike and dome, it must be uh, hookah. Agree? Okay. Now, what do you see here? Look at this one on the right. Again, an invasive hemodynamic tracing between the LV and the mitral, I mean the LV and the LA. Okay. So what does it show? What does it show? This is different plateau. Um, I will take that. Yeah. Okay. And, and what else? Giant V wave of mitral. Giant V wave. Exactly. So we have 
a large V wave. Okay, this large V wave, by the way, let's be clear about the V wave, is not necessarily severe mitral regurgitation, right? It's not necessarily yes. severe mitral regurgitation. Some other condition might lead to high V wave, like uh like what tr 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 like, i mean v wave in 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 the mitral uh, in the left atrium like this one yani yani when the left uh, left uh, atrial compliance is is much reduced yeah you might is find it used uh, exactly like in what yes. like in mitral stenosis no in mitral stenosis the la compliance is 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 reduced if you have increased venous retain, like if you have VSD, okay? So there are conditions that can elevate the V wave. Like in, when the V wave is maximally elevated like this one, they sometimes call it ventricularization of the V wave. It just looked like reaching up for the LV peak systolic pressure. That is MR, severe MR, okay? So this is severe MR. If we look at the hemodynamic on the left, it's pulmonary, pulmonary uh, pressure gradient. And you see the arrow is pointing to a peak, a strain peak. If you compare the red and white arrow, the white arrow is where usually the V wave, uh, I mean the, the peak pressure ends. But now I have a second wave that comes, which is not usual. It's abnormal. Any explanation for this second peak in context of severe MR? This is the same patient, had severe MR, and when they interrogated the uh, pulmonary, pulmonary pressure, they found this peak. Any guess? This is because, because of MR? Exactly. How come? Of rupture, mammary rupture. Rupture, papillary uh, monster. Uh huh. The who reverse V, V wave. Uh huh. Yeah, and it re reverse. Uh huh. How come the MR in the left atrium goes all the way to the pulmonary pressure? Tracing and affected this way. Yes, it can. It can when it is severe enough. It can spill over to the extent that it can reach up to the pulmonary artery and affect it this way. And that's why, even if you 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 probably have done uh, invasive. Uh, um, uh, uh, oxygenation run or uh, oxy run when you are checking for the saturation in the different chambers. If you have severe MR, there will be a step up in the saturation between the RV and the pulmonary. You believe it? Yeah, between the RV and the pulmonary, you can have a step up in the saturation and that's because of the MR coming all the way back. And because it's oxygenated blood, it increases the saturation and you suddenly have a step up. Normally, you don't have a step up between the RV and the pulmonary artery oxygenation or oxygen saturation. But if you have a step up, one of the explanation is the severe TR. And this is how the severe TR is hitting back into the pulmonary flow. Okay, extreme form of severe mitral regurgitation. Now, uh, remember, we have done so far two lectures on uh, echo, and every time we stress on the right way of doing it, the right way of doing it, okay? So many of our errors in calculation and interpretations boil back to faulty measurement, okay? That's why we have to go back and again, and again, and again. So you have to make sure that you are doing it right. Now, the placement of the sample volume in TDI is paramount. Where to put your TDI sample volume is so important. 
If you miss the right position, either up or down, you get different uh, velocities, different uh, signal, erroneous calculations. Okay, so this, this is so, so important. Now, uh, you know the mitral inflow, the M mode, usually you have the E, the A, the C is the closure point, and the D is the opening point. So we have E, A, C, and D. Now we have the B. B is interrupting the AC shoulder. A, C, shoulder. So this is the closure. This closure is usually smooth and going down. Now it is interrupted by a pump. And this is called the B pump. Okay. So what does that B pump mean? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. uh, the B pump is one of the specific features of elevated LVEDP and advanced grades of the systolic dysfunction. And I wish not to ask me why, because there is so much of speculation and theorizing in this area. We know for sure that the P pump is so uh, prognostic and diagnostic of advanced grade of diastolic dysfunction, but the exact mechanism of which is far from known. Okay, but the P pump is important. So if you demonstrate P pump in your AC shoulder in the mitral M mode. This is so specific of elevated LVEDP. Okay. Now, other thing. This is an MR signal. The one on the left, the one on the right. It's a CW of the MR. And there is an initial flow which falls in diastole. So this is diastolic MR. Agree? This is diastolic MR. So what does diastolic MR mean? What does it mean? Diastolic MR. Uh, it may indicate early closure of the mitral valve, probably in, 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 in severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, in severe aortic yeah. regurgitation. Uh -huh. LV uh, volume of load or LV uh, pressure high. Here we come down the magality for the two gifts of the water to our patients and higher than the diastolic pressure become high with a delay in the diastolic. Maybe normal in young patients, in young adults? Um, does that count? Uh, usually it indicates يعني, acute يعني, LV pressure overload or volume uh -huh. overload. And, uh -huh. and the left uh -huh. ventricle usually is not dilated to accommodate this. Uh, okay. This I might see uh -huh. Yes. Sorry, Maybe normal uh -huh. in young. Maybe uh -huh. normal in young, uh, in young persons. Yeah, I think my my block Paris degree hard work. Thank you so much, Amina. Thank you. So yeah, the diastolic MR can be a manifestation of first degree hard block. This is one thing, and probably this is one of the most common, according to my experience, cause of diastolic MR is the first degree hard block. The other thing is the stiff ventricle. Yes. Stiff ventricle, the same as it might impose B pump on the mitral uh, M mode, it imposes an initial diastolic flow in this uh, Doppler signal. This is again a stiff ventricle and elevated LVEDP, whatever the cause is. Okay, so the diastolic MR is again a sign of elevated LVEDP, marks the elevated LVEDP. Okay. That is one of the causes. Now, the question is why? The speculation is that usually the valve closes. You, you have the E, the initial flow, then it closes, 
Then it opens again with the atrial contraction, okay? Then it closes. If you have a stiff ventricle, it makes it hard for the closure because the pressure is so high. And it keeps the annulus kind of splinted and it's split apart. That's why you have diastolic flow because it's open during diastole. And the other thing is that you have the P-pump because the P-pump is what is an interruption of the closure. The valve is tending to close, but somehow is it splitted apart, okay? So the high LVEDP somehow keeps the valve open more than it should, leading to the P-pump, leading to the diastolic MR, and sometime leading to the mid-diastolic flow the so-called L hump. This is another thing we might come uh, across later, okay? But remember the diastolic MR and what does that mean? Again, this is the diastolic MR. Now, when we come to the, uh, I always love to show some gross uh, anatomical samples to correlate what we see by imaging with what is uh, in real, uh, in the, uh, the actuality of the lesions and how they actually look like. So these are vegetation on the aortic valve, okay? And you see in the aortic valve, one of the complication is abscess formation, right? Right? Abscess formation. The abscess forms in a particular area, which is the area between the aortic valve and the mitral valve, the so-called inter-valvular fibrosa. fibrosa. Yeah, it can form here, or it can form anywhere in the root, okay? One of the most important thing now we have adopted in our practice is that in any patient with aortic vegetation, we are doing daily ECG, daily ECG. Why the fuss? Why? Why do you think we insist on doing daily ECG for aortic valve vegetation? Uh, I must a degree of heart block. Exactly. Because a change in the baseline, any blocks that might be appearing over time is so meaning in the context of the aortic vegetation and it might mean the formation of an abscess or at least edema, induration, phlegmon formation because the abscess forms in stages. So any edema that develops in the root might compress on the uh, conduction system and leads to different form of blocks. So that's why we have adopted doing ECG on daily basis. Okay, now this is sort of induration, nodular induration on the mitral valve. Any guess what this is? Uh -huh. It doesn't look like the typical vegetation amorphous, standing lesions, and mobile. This is sort of nodular induration. This is a Lipman sac endocarditis. And we see it in echo, especially T as kissing lesion. We see it on the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. They tend to be sort of symmetrical and nodular. So they come together and they, they call them kissing lesions. Okay, so it's verrucous form of vegetation. It's different from the vegetation of the infective endocarditis. Okay. Now, the other thing is that in, during the acute traumatic fever, the valve is inflamed, like the one on the left, becomes so inflamed. But it doesn't lead to the picture on the right unless after so many years of repetitive injury and fibrous tissue formation and so on and so forth. So during the acute stage of rheumatic fever, you are not expecting to see the mitral stenosis and all of that. 
In fact, you might have mitral regurgitation because of the acute valvulitis. But as the healing process established over time, it leads to more and more fibrosis and, it, and the mitral valve will change into this ugly picture on the right, leading to stenosis and regurgitation. Okay, now what about this invasive hemodynamics on the left side? What do you think about it? Uh-huh. And left uh, between the uh -huh. uh, LV or the water. Uh-huh. Uh, look, it's okay. Yani ma ma fi gradient. Yeah? Okay. Between the uh, between, between the thought. There is no there is no look of gradient. Okay. The gradient look is okay. Okay. La al end the stolic L V E D B is high. And Very there good. is a rapid uh, uh, collapse of the aortic pressure. If you create Very good. the stolic phase. Yeah, very good. And the white pulse pressure, right? Yes, the I systolic may be 180, something like that, and that's 160. So very wide pulse pressure, yeah. Aortic this is a aortic regurgitation severe. Yeah, exactly. And what about the one on the right? There is gradient, D to B gradient. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Ma add you come yeah, again. This is B to B yeah. gradient. Okay. It's a lot actually. Yeah. Definitely more than 60. Yeah, so we have an aortic uh, LV gradient one. What else do we have here? Mm -hmm. Narrow pulse you... pressure? Narrow pulse pressure. Okay, and I wish to have... It is wide, wide pulse pressure. Uh, yeah, there is another... It is wide pulse pressure. Yes, so I will not yeah. take this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that the, the aortic apislope is so distant from the LV apislope? And if I take this one, let me show it to you. This part, sorry. Uh, this part, compare it to this part. You are supposed to have these two coincident. So they go together. This one and this one, they go together. Now it is late. And it's small. Uh huh. That's a peaking. I'm peaking. I'm peaking. I'm peaking. I'm peaking. I'm peaking. I'm peaking. يعني الهيموداينامك ما بيديك البيك تو بيك ات ذا سيم مومنت لانه ده بيكون ليت بيك يس فا الديفرنس بين بين الهيموداينامك بين الايكو ان الكاسلا الكاسلا ما بيديك البيك تو بيك ات ذا سيم ما بيديك يعني لما يكون ال في البيك ما بيكون ات ذا سيم تايم في الاوتيك في البيك Exactly. Actually, <laughs> Abdullah, you are talking about the uh, pressure recovery and the influence of that on the gradient calculation and the difference between calf based uh, gradient and echo based gradient. Lacking al Anan, I'm not talking about the gradient. I'm talking about why the pulse is coming late from the LV upslope. They are supposed to be coinc uh, coincidental or concomitant but not that much of gap. And there is a clinical feature you can demonstrate that is equivalent to what you see in here. And this is Exactly, yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so it's a slow rising pulse. Exactly, it's small and it's slow rising. So pulses, parvus, parvus. The other thing that you see the other thing that you see is this part again. You see this 
kind of shivering يعني this notching along this epislope they sometimes call it the anacrotic pulse because of this uh, vibratory notching and that indicates that the valve is stenotic so when the flow comes it creates that vibration okay but again it's a sign of uh, significant stenosis so the gradient is one the tardus parvus is second the anacrotic notch is third Dr. Hati, what is called Carbello sign? Uh, Carbello sign, I think I have a slide for this one. We are going to see now because it's about uh, a severely stenotic aortic valve to the extent that the catheter being in the LV and out of it has a difference in the pressure tracing, as I'm going to show you one of a slide of it. Okay, so I think uh, I.